Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to PMI and the PMP exam, past, present, and future with Mark Talbot and me. So Mark, how are you doing today? I am doing very well. How's everyone else? <laughs> well, good, I hope. So we've got a few folks on the call. We're gonna go ahead and activate the chat so that we can get some chats. So we have Angela, David, uh, Johannes, and Prasanna on the call. And uh, the purpose of today's uh, webinar is to discuss a topic that lots of us have interest in, the PMI and the PMP exam, past, present, and future. Well, let's go ahead and do some introductions first. So Mark, you wanna go first? Oh gosh, okay, sure. Um, again, Mark Talbert, um, I am a PMP, got my PMP actually way back in 1995. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. We um, actually in December of 1995, when I sat for the exam, we were basing the exam off of the draft of version one, and this is how thick it was. So wow. 64 pages, but it was still a, a monster of a test, just like it's always been. And I've been actively involved with PMI ever really since that time. So served on the board with the Washington DC PMI chapter um, pretty much right after that time, served in a number of different capacities as a, a VP of professional development, uh, you know, helping put together courses, VP of programs, signing up wow. speakers for dinner meetings and things like that. And I was trustee of the chapter from 2009 through 2013. So my career was kind of in the technical area, IT area. I worked for Hewlett Packard from 1980 to 2007. I left HP in 2007, took an early retirement package and decided, what am I going to do next? And I decided, <laughs> uh, I decided I wasn't ready to really retire. And I enjoyed uh, teaching quite a bit. So I started teaching PMP prep classes right about that time. And I taught for some of the bigger uh, REP companies like Velocity,ch uh, Global Knowledge uh, for a little while, and then started my own company in 2010. I'm arrogant enough that I thought, you know, I really, really would like to kind of create my own materials and uh, do that. So I've actually, it's worked out really well for me. I've been very happy teaching PMP prep classes um, since that time up to, up to the present. So I'm not sure if that's going to continue. You know, they're throwing such a curveball at us here now, and that's what we're here to talk about partly. That um, I've been an REP, registered education provider, in my company for about four or five years now. I guess it's five years, but I'm not planning to um, go, the, go the route of becoming an ATP, authorized training partner. They've increased the uh, the cost, they've multiplied it by four, oops. And for a small mom and pop company like my company, uh, that's too much. I'm just not gonna get enough benefit out of being an ATP. But the, the worst thing for it, for me in my mind, I'm very, very proud of my materials. I put a tremendous amount of time and effort into creating my materials. And the ATPs are going to have to teach off of their provided materials. And I don't wanna do that. So I don't <laughs> wanna teach off somebody else's stuff. And uh, I'm also not happy with uh, kind of the direction they're going again, just as a quick preview for what we're gonna talk about, but they're basically diminishing the importance of the PMBOK guide mm -hmm. for, the, for the test. So they're shoving it off into the background and they've had this great, uh, you know, revelation that what they really should be doing is focusing on the ECO, the examination content outline, or what's also called the role delineation study, but that's only 13 pages <laughs> and there's yes. not, there's not a lot in there. So they had a company, Logical Operations, uh, create a course based off that and they've created five modules that basically roughly map into the ECO and so the test 
is going to be based and it's probably going to be evolving it's going to be changing but come january the test is probably based um quite a bit more on the eco uh, than mm. the pinbot guide so i don't think come january that students are you're still going to need to know the 10 knowledge areas the five process groups the 49 processes but they're not going to have the kind of the tricky, nuanced, detailed questions that dig down into the ITTO inputs, tools, and techniques, and outputs. And it's yeah. too determined. It's, we, we need to find out, you know, are they going to need to know the tasks in the domains in the ECO or these modules? Are they going to need to know the tasks mm -hmm. and kind of key outputs of tasks? Is that now going to become in focus? But from what, what I know about how the test is going to change, it looks like almost the amount of information students are going to have to wrap their arms around is mm -hmm. almost going to double. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Well, let's hold, let's hold on to that thought <laughs> because we got, we got a boatload of stuff to share today, Mark. So that was a, right. my goodness, that was a very helpful introduction. So I'm glad that those who are here um, have gotten an idea of where we are going with our uh, discussion, and that's Mark. And I, I often say that I'm I'm just a baby in this stuff where Mark is concerned. So I, you know, Mark is going to do all the work today. I'm just going to uh, sit no, 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 no. because I'm, <laughs> I'm the baby. So I got certified ten years after Mark in 2005. I worked for a number of companies like Citigroup. Uh, did a number of consulting jobs with firms like Honeywell, Motorola, um, Emerson, U.S. Airways at the time, now American, and. Um, since I got certified in 05, I got very passionate about helping my colleagues, first of all, at Honeywell. So I started training even before I became a full-time trainer. I uh, got a lot of my colleagues certified back in 05, and I found there was a demand for this. So I kept on, even though I was working full-time, kept on contributing to the knowledge base of project management. And then 2009, you remember the uh, when the economy tanked, I had to reinvent myself for other reasons, similar to what Mark did in, in 07, but mine came early. I found myself without a job. My CEO called me into his office one day and said, Phil, I, I guess you know why you're here. I'm like, no, I don't know why I'm here. You know, my boss just left voluntarily. So I thought, well, mate, do you want me to fill his position? And he said, no, Phil, go to your office, take the box, pack your stuff. That's your last day, you know. Oh, man. I said, yeah, I said, wouldn't it be good to have known in advance? You know, I, I have a newborn. He's like, well, wouldn't it be nice to know a lot of things in life? It's your last day, sorry. So that was it. So for nine months, I couldn't find a job. And while I was looking for work, I started thinking, you know what, maybe I should just pursue this REP program because the PMI had this registered education provider. And like Mark, I had worked for a number of companies, one of them being Skillsoft, you know, no Skillsoft, Mark. So I worked for them for a while doing PMP training. I thought, you know what, I should probably just do this because um, I first worked for Thompson at G that was acquired by Skillsoft and they didn't bring me along for the ride for too long. So I worked there for just a bit. And then um, my tenor at um, this gaming company suddenly came to an abrupt end. So I started training uh, full time because I couldn't find a job and I decided I'm going to train. So I started off like, you know, OK, I'll do this part time. I'll still find a job. It didn't come for nine months. So I just ran with it. And then a client upon client um, came out of the woodworks so asking me to train them. And that's what I've been doing since 2010. Uh, many different um, entities, the Army, the Air Force, uh, NASA, the FBI, and I've been doing this like full time and very passionate about it, just like Mark. I, I thought I was bad. Mark is worse. So, <laughs> like I said, Mark is going to do all, all, all the talking, but Mark, let's go back to our, <laughs> let's go back to our presentation for today. Hey, so let's start off talking about Phil, the good old, uh-huh. If you don't mind, let uh, I'd like Susan to present here too. Can you might make her a co-presenter too? Absolutely. And have Susan That's introduce herself too. Gotcha. Let's make Susan a co-host. Yeah, she went for coffee. Are you back, Susan? Susan. Okay. If she gets okay. back, then we'll. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. 
Yeah, I wasn't able to unmute or share my video. It wasn't letting me do. Here we oh, go. Well, you're a co-host now, so there you okay. go. Awesome. All right, good, good. Thank you. Um, do you want me to uh, give you a brief introduction to myself? Absolutely, Susan. Everyone would like to know who you are. Okay, so um, sorry, just <laughs> in between meetings, making <laughs> sure everything looks okay. Um, so like yourself, I got my PMP in 2006. Um, so about around the time that you did. So don't don't feel too bad that you didn't. Mark, Mark is the only person I know that it, that, that has gotten it back that that far. You're the, he's the, the old dude. I'm, I'm the old dude. In Not the, old by age, old by certification. So don't feel bad. Um, <laughs> so so I got mine. Um, I remember my my uh, supervisor said um, this is something you should do, and I had not heard about it from anyone else. It was like kind of new in, in that space. And I was doing uh, DOD contract work at the Pentagon. Um, I got that certification. And after I got it, I actually started hearing a lot about it. And other people I knew, other colleagues of mine were like, oh, I need to get that certification now. And I'm like, really, I already have it, you know? So, so I was like a little bit ahead of the massive wave that hit the DC area where I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that the DC chapter has uh, 10,000 people, the wow. largest chapter in the world. Um, I could be wrong with that number, Mark might know better. Um, but anyway, so so with that, you know, I kind of was on the beginning of that huge wave of everybody getting that cert. Um, and then I found myself, I, I left the consulting um, business to go out on my own. And when I did that, I remember, um, you know, you, you have this thought of like what it's going to be like to, to work for yourself. And then there's the reality of what shows up. So I thought I'd continue to do consulting kind of work. Well, I ended up, I got approached by a university, uh, Post University in Waterbury, Connecticut. So I started teaching for them. And then I also got approached by a colleague of mine saying, do you want to teach PMP certification? And it had like never occurred to me to do it, but I'm like, yeah, I guess I can do that. And so I started doing it and then I started doing it for a bunch of people. Um, I've never had my company it's, itself per se do PMP training, but I've done it through a bunch of other people. And Mark is one of the people that I connected with because uh, his content's really great. And I actually went on to get uh, ACP certification, RMP certification. Um, I think I have 15 certifications now, nine of which are agile types of certification. Oh, nice. So um, one of the reasons for that is because there's there's these different certifying bodies and different clients want different certifications from different bodies. And so I've just gotten as many of them as I can to, to try to be able to answer questions and, um, and, and give people the type of training that they want and they need. Um, so I've gotten good at taking multiple choice question tests, which I actually hate as an engineer. Um, my, my background's mechanical engineering and I got my master's from George Washington University in engineering management. So engineers do not like multiple choice tests at all. So I find it very funny that I help people prep to take a test that I can't stand. Um, but, <laughs> but I think that probably makes me a good instructor because I can understand people's experience and, and kind of help them where they're at. Um, I'm not sure what else I could tell you about it, but, um, oh, I've, I was on the board of directors at the Southern New England chapter, which is Connecticut and Western Massachusetts. Um, I served on that for, I want to say about three or three and a half years um, when I was in that area. And I also was involved in some like regional conferences and I did some um, sort of leadership conferences within the region. Um, was pretty active in local chapters until I moved to Southern Eastern Delaware. So my closest chapter probably is DC. Um, and I don't, um, I don't want to drive in just for meetings. I usually go in to, to be with clients and things like that. So uh, most of my work is, is in the DC area or the New York, Connecticut, New Jersey area. So. Gotcha. Well, awesome, Susan. That's uh, very interesting. My goodness, fifteen PM, PM certifications. I think so. so, I, so I from think the, let me let me guess. The Scrum Alliance has to be there somewhere. Um, yes, I do have the CSM and the CSPO, um, and then I have. Um, so there's only nine of them are agile related. Uh, one is from PMI. It's the PMI ACP, 
and then I have, um, is it one or two from the scrum.org? I have also the scrum masters through them. Ten. And then scrum yeah. study has their own versions of these, which are a scrum master, scrum product owner, scrum developer, and then I'm a certified scrum trainer with scrum study. Um, so that, and I'm probably missing one of those. There's another one that they have in there. Um, and then the other certifications I have are in risk management. So um, my CASSP from ISC squared, uh, C risk from ISACA, um, Resilia from Axelos, which I think is more mm -hmm. like yeah. English based. Mm -hmm. um, and I might be missing one or two, but that that's 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 the idea. Basically, it's project okay. management. Um, I'm still actually working on some that I'd like to get. I want to get like <laughs> GMP from PMI, oh, and um, nice. and a few other agile certs. Um, I, I do, you know, I think they're valuable, but I would, I, to be honest, my driving mm -hmm. reason to get them was to be able to teach them. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But but I also have found it be very valuable to have a bunch of them. That way, if somebody says, I want to get one, which is the best, I can mm -hmm. tell them which would be the best for them based on what they want to do. And you really Absolutely. don't, unless you know enough about them, you really can't answer that question. Exactly. Exactly. I, I subscribe to that. I'm, I'm very similar to you. I, I have certifications from scrum.org, a couple from them, uh, one from, from the Scrum Alliance, one from PMI. And it's important to be relevant. The, the thing I want everyone who's watching to take away from this is we are not agile averse. We are friends of agile. So when we come to present some of the information and things we're thinking, please realize that we're both in the world of predictive, very much so, and also in the world of agile, very much so. So this is not a one-sided perspective of people who are anti-agile or anti predictive. But uh, let's really rapidly talk about the PMI path. So I'll just run through a few slides to get you caught up to speed with PMI. So Project Management Institute, we know it's a nonprofit, supposed to be a nonprofit organization, which we guess it still is. Um, huge, huge wallet at the moment. Um, if you don't know of the PMI, go to PMI.org. The PMI has set standard for ethics in the field which is why we are holding them accountable to a lot of the things that are supposed to be code of ethics from PMI. But uh, PMI has done a phenomenal job over the past 50 years in putting project management on the map, putting different certifications on the map, many of which you've heard. The footprint of PMI is huge. I mean, right now we have over 500,000 members. Actually, if you look at the credential holders, well over a million. So at the time this was put together from easyproject.com, there were 500,000 members in 208 locations. There are a lot more people. You heard what Susan said, 10,000 people in one chapter. That's massive. In 1969, Jim Snyder of Smith Klein and French Laboratories and Gordon Davis of the Georgia Institute of Technology had dinner in Philadelphia and agreed that there was need for an organization to offer project managers a forum for sharing information and discussing the industry. <laughs> Later that year, Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta held the first formal meeting of the nascent organization. Afterwards, in Pennsylvania, articles of association were filed by five founders of the Project Management Institute. Um, about that same time, PMI spent some of its resources on developing industry standards. Mm -hmm. This was done through the Professional Liaison Committee, which worked with the Technology Research Policy and Education Committees. Now, you saw what my held up a few moments ago. By the year 1980, these efforts were standardized into project management procedures and approaches by the year 1996. Uh, Mark, can we take a look at that thing one more time, that draft, that copy one more time? And how many pages is that? 64. 64. So let's fast forward to around 2002-ish, 2003-ish. And this is what they call the 2000 edition. And this is just uh, about 216 pages. Um, after that, there was a third edition. I don't have a copy of that, but there was the fourth edition after that. That's the I, fourth if had, edition. If you had given me a warning, I'd have pulled out the third edition because that's the one I took. <laughs> you want to grab so it? Have, yeah, it'd be, so it'd be actually, nice to see it. Do you have it to hand, Susan? Let me let me see if I, I have, can find it. I have it. it, Susan. I got Let's it right see. here. Absolutely. Hold on a Thank second. You. Thank you. But that's the one that I took and probably yourself too, because I think we were like within a year of each other. Yep. That's yes, it. yes, absolutely. 
Very good. 390 pages. Lovely, lovely. So 390 pages and moving on to the fourth edition, which is 467 pages. 467 pages. <clears throat> wow. And then after that one, we have the fifth edition, which is 588 pages. And then the sixth edition, you got that, Susan, for sure, on your desk, I could guess. <laughs> I, I actually, after a while, I started to get rid of some of them. That's why like, <laughs> I, I kept the one that I got and the most current one. And the sixth edition, thank you for sharing all of that. And with all of that said, going back into the past from 64 pages to 756 pages, my goodness, what a journey. Now, and if you add, uh, Phil, if you add the Agile Practice Guide, which is- Oh, yes, indeed. So then Thank you're up to reminder. about nine, you're up to 950 pages. <laughs> you, know, add two together. you know, Phil, you need, you need to get all those books stacked up and like get a picture of that with a measuring stick because <laughs> it's like, that's a lot. Look at that. You could, you could end up at a chiropractor for carrying that around. <laughs> so. Can I add but you know what, thing? Susan? Huh? So one more thing in here. So when we teach our classes, and Phil, I haven't checked with you on this ahead of time, but I'm sure you're going to agree, and Susan too. So we start off our PNP prep class and we say, okay, I hope you have all picked up these books. What do you <laughs> think? And you see people's eyes roll and you hear <laughs> comments and adjectives and they go, yes, that's the driest, most cryptic, most abstract most boring book I've ever read. And I said, yes, that gives me a reason in life, a purpose in life. I'm your interpreter of the Timbuk Guide. I'm gonna provide some good examples. I'm gonna bring it to life. I'm gonna explain what the heck they really meant in a lot of these places like uh, direct and manage project work. Why is the PMIS a key tool and technique? What is that? And, or why is it in monitoring control project work? And so we're explaining those things, which I don't really explain very well in the PMBOK. <laughs> I, I recommend it as a cure for insomnia. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I say the when, same people, thing. when people say it's dry, I go, oh, I guess you've never read a military spec. And mil specs are far more dry. <laughs> But that is, right? I think that is the only thing more dry than the Pinbot Guide. <laughs> and the other thing we add is no it offense. has, and the other thing we add is it really has nothing to do with the real world or getting ready for the test. Um, we do not, one of the worst mistakes you could make would be, uh, how would we solve this problem in my company, in my job? No, this is not about how you do things. Uh, you just have to put on your PMI blinders, think, <laughs> think PMI, and just absorb that whole framework and that culture. Drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. And now, and now that's changing. Now they're switching. Again, they're de-emphasizing the PMBOK guide as they're moving into uh, January mm. when the tests change. So they're shifting focus to yeah. the ECO, the examination content outline. So let's get there, Mark. We're, we're gonna hit there in a second because okay. I know everyone came for that. So let's very speedily, I mean, people just wanna know what is the future? We know what the present is, but let's finish the past. So let's go on to the CEO. So when you got certified around about then, probably Virgil Arcada was the CEO. Do you recall, Mark, who was CEO when yeah. you got certified? Yeah. Um, I did, we did meet uh, Greg Ballestrero multiple times since we're so close to Philadelphia, mm. actually they would invite, they actually Greg came and spoke at a number of our dinner meetings mm. and uh, they would invite um, a good part of our board to come up to Philadelphia, mm -hmm. um, King of Prussia area and meet with them. Mm. That all stopped with Mark Langley. So Mark mm. Langley. Uh -oh. The, uh, so, he, he no longer rolled out the invitation to us. Yeah, but there was, a, there was a lot of, there was a flurry of these big, really huge PMI events when Mark came on. And that's when it, it just began to swell from like 250,000 people certified in 2005 to mm -hmm. like going to six, 500,000 at the time Mark left. And then after Mark left in 2018, uh, Sunil came on in 2018 till current. And um, that pretty much wraps up the story. So it's been a handover, if you want to say, of uh, four or five 
um, major entities who were in the forefront. And there's a lot of drama, which we won't go into regarding the past and regarding the Pembok guide and regarding things that happened that we will not talk about here. But those who are in the inner circle know that the Pembok guide has had quite a colorful history in some of the original writers of the guide. Right, Mark? We won't go into that. We'll stay away from that. So Lama, yeah. let's stay right. away. <laughs> well, well, Phil, one of the things that I noticed in that uh, 210 uh, plus, uh, sorry, 2010 plus uh, time period, uh -huh. it, it went from being something people didn't know about to yes. something people knew about to something people had to have if they wanted to get a decent project management job. And, and that, that to me was a huge progression in, in about a decade. <clears throat> Um, and like I said, I was myself, I seem to be ahead of that game by like a few years. Um, but, you know, by, by 2010, people were like, I don't know what this thing is, but I have to get it or I can't teach project. I can't do project management. I can't be a PM anymore. Um, and that was a huge shift because a decade before that, it, it wasn't such a thing. So um, I think that's very, that's very notable because that's, yeah. that's what got us to where we are today, where all of that growth, um, I haven't seen the stats, but I believe that growth showed up um, mm -hmm. in that decade. I, I totally believe that as well. So um, we, we, we'll stay away from the landmines because I'm sure we all have um, some uh, perspective to share about how things develop through the different handlings of, <clears throat> of the PMI to, to where we are today. But Susan is absolutely right. The growth in that decade um, I honestly, Mark was responsible for a lot of growth. That's all I'm going to say. I, I just say he was responsible for a lot of growth. All right. So fast forward to today. All right. And of course the team, no one does anything great without the team. So let's just say the team at the time, you know, and, um, I don't know when you became an REP, uh, um, Mark, but they were really hitting it out of the park way back weren't they? I mean, in the earliest stages of the REP progression. Uh, but let's talk about the future because that's, that's what a lot of us are looking to know about. So Mark, let's start off, Susan, let's start off with your thoughts about version seven and what we know about the exposure draft. So Susan, do you, do you, do you want, want to go first? Well, um, you know, I, I, I'm, treading it lightly. Um, I, I have some very real concerns. It seems to be uh, the biggest change that I've seen. Um, and I, yeah, my first exposure was probably the third edition. Um, and I've probably been, I think I've been teaching since the fourth edition. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned because I, um, I do understand uh, integrating Agile into it and integrating Agile more into project management. Um, but I also think that there's still value in traditional project management. And so I'm a little bit uh, concerned about, uh, you know, kind of watering down traditional uh, as an approach um, that agile is better. Um, I, I think there are different tools and I always think of it as like a hammer and a screwdriver. Uh, if you have a nail, the hammer is better. If you have a screw, the screwdriver is better. So um, I don't think there's a better tool all in all. I think that it depends on what the situation is. Um, actually, Mark and I are co-authored a book on hybrid project management with really just that purpose in mind, um, talking about that. My other concerns, um, they seem to have shifted from this whole process focus and uh, the, probably my biggest concern is the change to the exam, the change that the that PMI is making um, is making with the materials themselves. And instead of registered educational providers having ATPs, um, any exam change as an instructor, I'm always hesitant. I was talking to somebody this morning, a student of mine, because I teach at three universities, and one of my students said, you know, what should I do with the PMP? Should I should I study for it? Should I take it? How should I prep for it? And I said, well, at this point, unless you're planning on getting it before the end of this month, I would kind of wait and see um, because I don't like the unknown exam. I don't know any instructor that likes it, um, but that's okay. normal. What my concern is, is the shift of 
not not allowing REPs to come up with their own material. I've talked mm-hmm. for a number of companies. I've used different people's material, and it's not all alike. It's not all equal. And mm-hmm. um, when I recommend to people where to take a class, I I push them towards a smaller business because I feel like smaller training companies really have to do a lot to provide a good mm-hmm. service and good sure. content and good training. And I don't yeah. see that with larger companies. So my concern with this whole ATP thing is that PMI is is having everybody use the same material. And mm. I'm not so sure th- th- how good that material is. That is that is probably my number one concern. Um, but there is a huge shift. And I feel like the more I learn, the more questions I have for PMI, um, mm. I, I don't get more answers. I get more questions. So that that's mm-hmm. kind of just to start where I'm at. So there's just, just, I'm a risk manager. I don't like a lot of uncertainty. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to identify and, and manage the uncertainty. And, and right now I'm just sort of like, well, I guess I have to wait and see. So I'm not real comfortable to be honest. I'm not real happy about that, but, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. You know? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I hear you. I'm taking my notes and these are really great points. So just to reiterate the concerns that agile people have this warped mentality that agile is better than predictive, failing to realize going back to page 14 in the agile practice guide, where we have the Stacy complexity model, there's no evil or good approach. It's tailoring the approach. And on the Stacy complexity model, you're always going to have stuff that is extremely predictable. You've got very low uncertainty, which means the requirements are certain. Why do you want to use Agile, like you said? Why do you want to use a hammer for what you should actually use a backhoe for? There's some projects, they're just not going to go away except you use something substantial. And there's this mindset that process is bad. Process is bad. Process is not bad. It's all about tailoring. So I took that away from what you said. And I also took away the fact that you and Mark, you co-authored a book about hybrid project management. When is that coming out? It's out. It's out. What's it called? It's called that. And so it's called uh, Hybrid Project Management. And it's succeeding on modern projects using agile methodologies and traditional methodologies. So nice. So I think, you know, for as Susan said a few minutes ago, um, no, there's no one perfect process, Mm -hmm. there's no one perfect way to do things. and there's, uh, there are hybrid agile approaches. So you've got safe, mm. and you've got disciplined agile and PMI's purchased uh, disciplined, disciplined agile. agile. And, right. And you're really investing in that. But the, oh, the, the agile book. Is, Lovely. A little bit, I, yeah, here's our book. Susan's So we can book. get that on, on Amazon, huh? Yeah, it's on Amazon and it's in both Kindle and uh, hard copy. Lovely. We've actually recorded it too, but nice. it falls in my court. So I got to get that going and we got to get the audible version of that too, because the younger generation, my kids, that's my kids. <laughs> they don't read, they don't sit in the No corner. one reads anymore, right? They read a <laughs> book like mom and dad do, but um, yeah. everything is, everything's got to be on the phone and uh, listen <laughs> to things on audible. That's the way. So we got to do that. We got to get with it. Mark's got to get with it. <laughs> yep. Yep. We'll look anyway, forward to that. Any, there's no one perfect process, but um, so we're kind of off topic here, Phil, kind of. Going so we're, no, we're, 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 still on, we're still on topic. So we're talking about the importance of, of hybridization. And I'm, I asked for the thoughts about version seven and right. let's fast forward into it, Mark. We, We've seen this before. Susan, you've seen this if you've been to PMI's website of late. And you can see the breakdown of the 6th edition to the 7th edition. So, I, Mark, help me. You be the energizer, Bunny, because I don't even want to get started. Because once I get started, I never come back. Help us. <laughs> you, you always sound so cool, calm, and collected and sensible when you're delivering your points. I'm all over the place. So, take... Again, we don't know. All, we, all we've seen is the exposure draft and a little bit of this platform where they're telling us, um, what's it, um, I forgot the name of it now, the standards platform mm. thing that uh, has awesome. a little more meat to it. But um, 
they're again they're kind of ditching the 10 knowledge areas of the PMBOK guide and they're moving to so the 10 knowledge areas um, are kind of going away or they're at least going into the background and they're being replaced by eight performance domains um, and those eight performance domains are team stakeholders life cycle planning navigating uncertainty and ambiguity delivery performance and project work so <laughs> there's a lot there and it all overlaps to me it's it's much more mishmashed it, it's not intuitive um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me kind of starting out if, if i've never met a senior manager a sponsor that i'm doing a project for where if i'm going to meeting with them that they're not going to ask me hey mark when are you going to be done and how much is this going to cost and what are you actually going to get me? So what scope, what quality are you going to get in, those, in that time frame for that budget? So the 10 knowledge areas, scope, time, cost, quality, resources, communications, risk, and so on. That is so compelling and intuitive and makes a lot more sense. And, and I don't think also ISO has standardized on that. And I doubt ISO is going to ditch the 10 knowledge areas and move to this new structure. And I doubt that the real world is going to ditch, you know, the triple constraints, which are now six constraints, right? Scope, time, cost, quality, resources, risk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the triple constraints are six, but um, I doubt the real world is going to move away from that. And Agile actually fits into those knowledge areas quite well you know absolutely the it's, first thing you're doing yeah. in putting together what's the first thing you're going to do and in, in agile susan you're going to put together the product backlog mm. so and you're going to start very high level with epics and features and stories that would, that would be scope <laughs> and then you're and yes and then you're going to get some initial estimates of those epics features and stories Estimates of <laughs> so your time and cost or relative yeah. sizing anyway, yeah. and uh, you're going to do those things. So that fits into scope, time, and cost. Um, you have release planning. Release planning is right. about scheduling. It's just high level. Right. Right. Um, yep. Cost. Your cost for most agile projects is fixed because you've got a certain amount of resources, a certain amount of time, so, so that you know what your cost is. That's actually usually pretty unmalleable, which is what makes, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's Agile is a constant negotiation for scope. You know, this, the schedule set, the team is set, which means the cost is set. So all your, your, instead of, so the way I look at it is I actually look at that, that triple constraint and um, with traditional scope is fixed and we estimate cost and schedule and we flip that triangle with Agile, we have cost and schedule fixed, and then we estimate our scope. So the Ooh. triple constraint, to me, that's gravity for project managers. And I don't care if PMI gets yep. rid of it. I'm still teaching people right. that way. Because, and the real because world's gonna do it too. It's just the most because practical it's all way to teach. Yeah, and really the, the 10 knowledge areas the triple constraints and all that all fits into kind of project management 101 you, for, you're figuring out what is it called the five w's and, and h who yes. what why when how well that kind of does map you know that's basic and that maps also into the 10 knowledge areas agile maps into that it's far more yeah. intuitive to me and you know frankly i'm never going to impress a sponsor a financial person, a senior manager by telling, hey, we've had this, you know, we've had this revelation and we're switching off of processes and now we're going to principles. We're going to these new principles and domains. They're going to say, frankly, Mark, I couldn't care less. <laughs> you know, when are you going to be done and what's this going to cost? Yeah. Absolutely. And it's on page 91 here. There's a correlation between the knowledge areas and how Agile works in those knowledge areas. So when I see this um, departure from the, it's like fighting against gravity. It's, it's just, there's no sense in it. So I, I, I totally agree with, with what you said, Mark, the 10 knowledge areas and the five process 
no matter how you try to sugarcoat it and say, yes. oh, we're just moving them into the background, they're going to be in standards plus. Think about it. Doesn't it concern anyone that this book of 756 pages is suddenly going to be cut down right. by 500 pages? Isn't and Phil, crazy? worse than that, I mean, there's 10 knowledge areas that pretty much existed intact for over 20, 20 years. So even in this draft, you know, mm. there's nine knowledge areas here, but you basically got the same stuff. So what yeah. happened between this 64 page document and our mm -hmm. over 900 pages of the uh, version six and uh, agile practice guide, what happened, what changed and what's the real problem? The problem yeah. was that they just, it just got bloated and blown away with ITTO. So mm -hmm. if you go back to, I mean, as you went along in your progression of PMBOK guides and we saw the uh, volume of the PMBOK guides swell up to, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, from 500 pages to 750 pages exactly. and so on, the ITTO also started exploding. And in That's version true. five, I think there's something like 590 ITTO. Oh my well, God. guess what? In version six, there's, if you add all the little bullets that go under things like data gathering tools, data representation tools, personal effectiveness tools, if you add <laughs> all those bullets under those uh, what I called umbrella tools, you're up to a whopping 1,400, more than 1,400 ITTO. And my students oh my in my class, there's just no way. So I'm teaching a four-day class, maybe a five-day class. There's, you know, they're just, their eyes are rolling, they're glazed, and they're saying, how can I assimilate all the stuff? And, and a lot of the stuff, is it really that key? Do you really need to know what influence diagrams are? Is that part of the toolkit? Is that germane for everyday project management or a bubble chart or even Monte Carlo? Mm -hmm. So Monte Carlo has been around forever. We've been teaching yeah. that forever. And forever I've been asking students in class. So I'd always say we get to that part in developed schedule where we're talking about uh, simulation and Monte Carlo or quantitative risk analysis. And we're talking about it and I'll say, okay, Hold up your hand. How many of you have used Monte Carlo in your projects? And I've taught, I've taught thousands of students over these 12, 13 years. I've taught thousands of students. How many have raised their hand? Not many. They must have taught any students in NASA. I know NASA so, uses it. And it's census. So Susan and I both teach at the Census Bureau. And I've got a lot of statisticians at the Census Bureau. So <laughs> I probably had 15 students raise hands. Most of them were at the Census Bureau. Yeah. It's funny. Actually, they used it. They would use it for project selection, for modeling, and trying to figure out what project's going to have the most ROI. But yeah. they rarely used it in quantitative risk analysis for trying to figure out what contingency reserves should really be. But anyway, there was all these arcane, very, <laughs> uh, you know, specialized thing type things. They yes. weren't really part. So PMI could have, you know, that was their problem. They went wrong with the, there's no need. This is, what is the PMBOK guide supposed to be? It is not supposed to be a menu of how to do a project. It was never, ever, ever intended to be a menu or a methodology of how to do a mm -hmm. project. And that's why it's so cryptic. That's why it's so generalized because it's meant to support all projects. And they meant all. They meant all projects in all industries, no matter what type of contract, whether we're in fixed price, cost reimbursable, time and materials, what. Uh, it was supposed to support it. And so it was mm -hmm. all things to everybody. And that's why it was so abstract and generalized. But if it's a framework, do we, you know, what 750 page document is a framework? So they, need, <laughs> so they, they needed to put this PMBOK guide on a diet, a severe yeah. diet, and get it back something closer to version two. Exactly. You know, it's, version or this. It's funny you should say that, Mark, because the latest version of the Scrum Guide is shorter than the previous version. So the Scrum Guide 2020 pages. just came out. 
And I was talking to somebody about this morning and I said, you know what? Somebody once said, if, if you want me to give you documentation, I can give you documentation. If you want it to be brief and to the point and short, it's going to take longer. Yes. Right. So it's, <laughs> so it's like that whole idea of lean. I'm like, why don't, why don't you, you know, why don't you get a cup of agile when you're working <laughs> on your book and, and, and employ some of that lean to just add it up and make yeah. it bigger, bigger, bigger. I, I, I don't agree with that. I think that we need to simplify things, but I'm also a person, you know, as an engineer, I like to take complicated things and make them simple. Exactly. Um, there are many people in the world, especially in the world of consulting, especially in the federal government sector, where people take simple things and make them complex. Yeah. Um, not not yeah. to be mean, but <laughs> our, but Congress is, does a really good job of taking simple things and making them complex. Um, if we take complex things and make them simple, I mean, as, as an instructor, that's what's mm -hmm. workable. Um, and I look at the scrum guide, look at how long that is and look at the pinbot guide. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it, we can take some things out. There, there are too many inputs, outputs, tools and techniques, things that people don't use. But, I agree. But they yeah. don't need to swap out the knowledge areas. And the knowledge yeah. areas were fine. Yes. And again, I think they're a lot more intuitive. They're a lot more basic. What they need, what they, where they went wrong was with this massive multiplication of ITTO that occurred over the 15, 20 years. And, and a lot of that is not germane mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, like That's I said to Phil, when we were trying to put this together and talk about this, I, I'm afraid that PMI is creating with version seven, and also even by switching the emphasis away from the PMBOK guide to the ECO. So mm. it's not just happening with version seven, it's happening now. This is gonna happen in January with the test in January. They're shifting the focus to the examination content outline. Mm. And I think this could very well end up being new Coke. The switching <laughs> off classic Coke, they're going to new Coke. And this is going to not be good. It's Before not going to be good. We've had many conversations about that. That um, <laughs> I, it's a wait and see. But I would not be surprised. And and I don't I don't know that they will say, hey, we made a mistake. But but we'll see we'll see something shift. And mm -hmm. and um, I'm actually kind of hoping so because you know I I'm a very organized person. Except if you look at my desk right now, it may not occur <laughs> that way. But. Um, but I'm a very organized person and I agree these, these knowledge areas are key knowledge areas and you do need to have understanding of the different knowledge areas. I have no problem with those processes. I have a problem with adding inputs, outputs, tools and techniques every time somebody takes a look at it. I think that could be yeah. too much. Yeah, every um, new author and there's millions of authors wanted to get in, but guess what else they're scrapping? So I, I glossed over this too quickly. They're not only diminishing or de-emphasizing the 10 knowledge areas in the PMBOK guide, guess what else is being mothballed or put away? The five process groups. Isn't that crazy? And that really doesn't make any sense. The five process groups, what's the precursor? What's the foundation of the five process groups? The, the, the plan do DCA. The plan do check act loop. I mean, they and map the, the, perfectly. And guess what? Every major quality, proprietary quality methodology is based off the, the plan to check act loop. It is vital. It is, you know, so involved in every quality methodology to jump I, that is, is nuts. I <laughs> use the five process groups to teach people who know traditional project management about agile. Mm, so let's say you right. take a scrum project, you've got a two week uh, sprint. Well, guess what you do? You initiate the sprint, you plan, you then execute, you got your daily scrum. Yeah. Monitoring, controlling, you also do that in the daily scrum. And then at the end, you you do um, your closing, which is your yeah. retrospective and your iteration review or your sprint the review. review. Exactly. It, 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 to me, a sprint is a two week project That's and it, it has those five process groups. So, so to eliminate them, I'm like, I'm not eliminating them because I'm a pragmatist, okay? I'm gonna use what works. And I know every project I've ever done, whether it was one week long or you know one week long iteration or a two year long project, I've had initiating, planning, executing, 
along with monitoring, controlling, followed by closing. And that's just how it works. And if mm -hmm. I just, I just can't even, I can't imagine not putting my head around that. That That's agile important thing. Agile to me, and we say this in our book, but agile to me, one of the beautiful things in agile is it's taking that plan, do, check, act loop, and it's speeding it up. All of these interactions, all of these, what does extreme, what does XP do to all those interactions between the different stakeholders? It just multiplies it. You've got pair programming at the most basic level. You have pair programming where there's feedback in seconds. Mm -hmm. And then you've got continuous integration. You're checking in code multiple times a day. That's happening in hours. You've got a daily stand-up meeting. You've got uh, review meetings. You've got a review at least at the end of the iteration, but oftentimes even more often than that. So you're taking these feedback cycles, these feedback loops, these interactions, you're speeding that up. And that's just huge for increasing your chances for success, especially in our modern world where the world is just changing so fast, it makes your head spin. Absolutely. And we got a question as a follow on to this great point that you both raised. And it's from Johannes. And it's given that the new PMBOK guide is about to be realized in the project mode, I'd really like to know what type of project development lifecycle had been chosen. If it was an agile one, why didn't we get a PSI or an MVP? <laughs> <laughs> why weren't we asked to read, correct, or validate increments of it? Videos about the content don't allow us to validate your work appropriately. This is a brilliant comment, Johannes, because what they've done is they've put this so-called webinars, such as the link I put in the comments, um, to tell you what's coming. It's like dictatorship. You know, we got all those, those uh, you know, um, what do you call it, decision-making techniques. This is pure dictatorship. They're just forcing it on you. So what, what do you folks think? What, what kind of development approach, if any, was used for this? What do you think? I, my, my opinion, one that did not entail the use of uh, listening to and working with stakeholders. It I, smacks. I, you know, from version, what was it? Version, was it version five or was it six where they started, uh, they, they added the knowledge area of stakeholder management? Yes, well, five. Why not use yeah, that? Five. Why not use that? I mean, you drive me crazy with it. <laughs> like, like, how can you not ask us what is the impact? We're in the foxhole, you know? Mm -hmm. Mark and I and, and you, Phil, we're in the foxhole and you're yeah. not talking to us. Maybe, maybe you should like, mm -hmm. you know, try your own soup while you're cooking it. You know? Hello. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Susan. And I, a lot of people think that I'm against PMI. I love PMI, but we need to hold them accountable so we yeah. don't all go down the drain. It's like the death march. You know, the, the IBM death march as depicted by Apple in the 80s. It's like walking everyone off the cliff like that. Ad that was is. an amazing ad. I remember <laughs> Wasn't that. It? I, that's how I see PMI lining us up, walking us off the cliff. It's just not acceptable. I mean, Mark, what do you think about this development approach? Well, they definitely didn't do that. You're right. And um, gosh, I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> I've, never, <laughs> Let, I've never been. Let's real do it. I've never been real <laughs> politically correct, but um, I need like in and I am on the older end of the equation. You can see that. <laughs> I, I, I am too, like but I use days. technology. I, I, I would feel be, like in but... the good old days, there was more interaction between what we call GOC or Global Operating Center, so global. Mm -hmm. I felt like there was more interaction and more feedback between the chapters who was feeding information back to global and vice versa. And I feel like that is attenuated, that's diminishing too. And I think that's wrong. And I think that's sad that things are going that way. And um, I could say a lot more, but I won't. <laughs> you know, just, but we're, uh, gonna, we're gonna get it out of you, Mark. You can't escape, we're gonna get it out of you because I know, I know, I know, I know there's more to come, but let's take another question. This is from Daryl, it says, with the changes happening with the new exam, the seventh edition and encouraging Agile, will the PMI ACP certification uh, be at the same level as the PMP? That's a great question. And I think there's a lot of confusion there. And Daryl, it even goes farther than that because they're pushing disciplined Agile 
uh, very, very hard. They just introduced a new, I, I forgot the name, and I have to dig out the email, but there's another new Agile certification oh, yeah. they're yep. pushing and they're stuff. Full of them. So it, full. it's just become very mishmashed and confusing. And why, why should we, um, you know, why should we go, or should we still go after the ACP and stuff? And, and I've said this to Susan, I think I said it to Phil, for me, now, this, you're not going to like this. <laughs> this sounds over <laughs> the top in my world. But I would ask you, as, and I think most of you here on this call are PMPs, yes? And I would say, what is there in the RMP certification that a PMP shouldn't know? Risk <laughs> is vital to project management. Yeah. Uh, Susan also co-authored a book about risk. And some one of the authors, I'm not sure if it was Susan or one of the others, put it brilliantly. And they said, project management in a lot of ways is really about risk management. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say, and I would say there's nothing in the RMP that a PMP shouldn't know. Mm -hmm. And I would say the same thing for Agile. For me, there's nothing on the ACP that a PMP shouldn't know. You should really know all of that. It's just vital for today's world, yep. for our modern world. But they're paying us these big bucks. Ha, 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 that was a joke. <laughs> but they're paying these big dollars to project managers to figure it out. What, as Susan was saying, what tool is best suited for what situation, what methodology? And there's, very, there's nothing in the PMBOK guide and there's very little literature anywhere that helps project managers figure out what methodology is best suited to a certain situation. So Susan and I tried to go after that in our book on hybrid, and we're trying to explain where we think the different methodologies uh, and how you use them together, how you use them in a large complex project together. That's difficult. They, by the way, the agilists, most agilists don't like that. Most <laughs> yes. hybrid. Well, let's call them Puritans. Let's say the Puritans yes. and the I, Zealots. I call them scrum dementalists. <laughs> uh, and one of my favorite, I, I love Jeff Sutherland. Oh, I think Sutherland is awesome. I and love I him. His book on <laughs> Agile, Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work and Half the Time is brilliant. And I think it's one of the best books on Agile. But guess what? Jeff hates hybrid. He yep. thinks he wants to pull out the cross and hold it up. And he said, if you try to do hybrid, you're not going to, you're going to, it's almost guaranteed failure. So I think. Well, let's be honest. Let's be honest, Mark. It's all about people's perception of what hybrid is. Right. Like yeah. people have made some really bizarre structures that are really waterfall. And when I say waterfall, we're not just talking about the processes and how they're interwoven. We're talking about people leading in a draconian type of way and not letting the team decide what to do. If we talk about the fundamental principles of agile, you could take those and you could be comfortable in any hybridized setting, as long as you follow the rules, follow the rules, you know, the 12 principles and the mindset. But, you know, I, I guess- think it takes I think, I think you're right. I think what people don't like about hybrid agile is it's a name that people call it when they haven't made a definitive uh, decision about how they're going to deal with things. And, you know, it becomes scrum or fall or um, what, it, what did you call it? scrum or fail. That's what Mark says, scrum or fail. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it is not a buffet where you mm. go and say, hey, I'm going to get like cake and jello and I'm not going to eat salad. I'm not going to get broccoli. Like that doesn't mm. work, you know. Um, but when you say definitively, okay, this part of the project we need to, to use traditional project management for. We have known scope, uh, we have known requirements, we know what we wanna do, we know how long it will take. These other parts, we don't really know. Or maybe we have some regulatory requirements, the federal government or other regulatory um, healthcare, highly regulated, uh, even in insurance companies have a lot of regulation, financial institutions have regulation. So they can't just say, okay, let's just do agile and exactly. throw out yes. throw out traditional. So so it's Great. like I respect I highly respect Sutherland. I highly respect him. Yeah. And he's like, 
go go scrum and never go back. And and I I disagree with that. I think that there is a there is a right mixture, but I don't. I think you need to be inte- uh, you know intentional about it. You you can't just say, oh you know this is like a a bastardized version of agile because we didn't know how to do it right. Okay, well that's not going to work. I don't yeah. I don't agree with that. It's, um, yeah, it's very simple. So Susan, let's talk about this because of course the Stacy complexity model is a staple. So we have things that are close to certainty, right? Yep. And we have things that are far away, you know, far from certain. Is it wrong to be in this domain if you have requirements that are close to certain? Is it is it yep. bad? Is that a bad thing? And let's say there's a trajectory somewhere along the line you are more towards the certain than the uncertain. Is it bad to be somewhere towards certain, but not completely to be more predictive over here? And no, in fact, if you, if you take a project where you have a high level of certainty and you try to manage it using an agile approach, I can almost guarantee you, you will use more resources and take more time. It, it, it's it's not for that it's purpose. Not needed. It's over. I can use a hammer to get a screw through the wall, but <laughs> I'm going to use a lot more resource. It's not going to be pretty. I can do it, but it's not the best. It's not the best tool. So why see, why, you... why why do that? Why exactly? Why, we have all these great tools. Why not use them appropriately? Um, that's where the wisdom is. The wisdom is what tool do I apply in this situation? That's what creates wisdom. It's not having a tool and cramming it into something to be a solution. Yeah. So. I, I don't know, this is part of my frustration when people think predictive is evil, it's bad, it's unwieldy. There are gonna be some projects where you should use predictive method. Yeah. It's like what Susan is saying, why won't you use what is best tailored or best fit in the job? Right. I, and I, I'm PMI, they do not seem to get that. I mean, it's on page 14 of their own book, you know, the. The Stacy complexity model, even though they've tried to kind of camouflage that it's the Stacy complexity model, yep. we know yep. it is. Yep. And, it, you know, and Good. getting back to Daryl's question, you know, here's the challenge they've added discipline agile. I have a PMI ACP. I still teach PMI ACP. I teach a significant amount of it. I don't know where that fits in with discipline agile and the new PMP exam, which includes a lot of agile. I'm like, seems like they're squeezing the ACP out. Like it seems like they're no longer relevant. And and in my opinion, the ACP is one of the best agile certifications right. you can get because you learn a little bit about all of the different agile methods. It's not just scrum. Right. And, yeah. and I think it's a good, gives you a good lay of the land. What's an agile approach? You know, all those mm-hmm. other scrum certs they have, they're just about scrum. They don't teach it's you about also, me. They don't teach grown. you about me. It's also right. grown very nicely in the time since it's come out. So there's over yeah. a million, there are over a million PMPs today worldwide. And then their next most popular certification is the CAPM. So Certified Associate in Project Management. I think there's what, 40 some thousand, yeah, 50 40 some, about 50,000. But the ACP is closing in on that. Yep. So there's over 30,000 ACPs. Are yep. they going to throw those people overboard? Are they going to say, ah, Sorry, we kind of made a mistake with the ACP. We want you to go after X, Y, Z now. Isn't Are they really going to do that? Mark. I hope not, Daryl. Mark, but I... the picture they're giving us, Daryl, is um, a little confused. So, Mark, help us to understand the past. Were there instances where they tried other certifications that didn't work similar to what they're trying to do now? Do you recall any of those? No. But I can tell you, here's an interesting thing. Right after I got started in the DC chapter and got on the board, so this is probably 97, 98. So a new CEO, and I have to go look up his name, a new CEO of PMI came in and he basically wanted the PMP to be what is today the PGMP. And he basically was saying, no, uh, we're only going to grant the PMP to project managers who have direct reports. You have, oh, yeah. to have, you have to have people working for you huh. and you are their direct report um, manager and mm-hmm. stuff. So basically this is even beyond strong matrix. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, there project was such eyes. a revolt. 
there was oh, uh, the, chap the chapters went ballistic at the time. That was a much smaller membership in PMI at that time. But there was such a revolt that uh, he was forced to resign. Oh, my goodness. But Mark, this brings up a very good point. <clears throat> Don't we see the amount of havoc one person could do? Because I believe that this move in the seventh edition is not, of course, it's not the mass populace. It, there's no consensus. It's a select group of people who came up with this brilliant idea and decided to white force it on tower. over a million. And they're academics, it seems to me, and again, not to, I'm not being charitable and I'm probably not being fair, but here I am. And it seems to me like it is coming out of academia. It's white ivory tower stuff that uh, doesn't, <sighs> doesn't play in the real world. Oh my gosh. I mean, just looking at the senselessness in trying to force project managers to use principles as a base. We all have some ideas, you know, of what principles are, even without coming into the PMI. Why should they sure. make this a principles party? And it's all, it's there all, it's already there, but, and they're mixed in tools and techniques. They're mixed in concepts in the existing structure. They're not inventing anything new. Mm. Look, project management is, there's nothing new in project management. There's nothing that, you know, hard to understand about what, what our job is. It's a very hard job. What you guys are doing is a very difficult job because you're in that classic situation where you're not given, I don't care who you are, what type of level of authority you've been given as project manager. You're that very empowered person in strong matrix. Guess what? Mm. You have key stakeholders that outrank you all over mm. the map. So you're in a large complex project, your sponsor, the customer, um, partners, other senior managers, perhaps they outrank you. And the difficulty is you've got to bring them together somehow, some way. You've got to get these people on the same page regard regarding requirements, scope and quality, mm -hmm. regarding key constraints. And that is difficult. Yeah. And I've been, to, I've been to a lot of dinner meetings, believe me, <laughs> over 20 plus years at the DC chapter. I've heard of, uh, I've heard some amazing presentations on different topics um, and some where projects went dreadfully wrong. We heard, we brought in a high level DOD program manager, Dr. Stephen Meyer, who talked to us about the F-22. Mm. He talked to us about the Abrams armored vehicle. He actually had a list of about 10 weapon systems. Every wow. weapon system was more than a billion dollars. That was with a B, more than a billion dollars over budget and more than two years, you know, uh, past schedule. Mm -hmm. And the, and the problem, Dr. Meyer put it, well, we had some very powerful stakeholders <laughs> and some were pushing for bleeding edge requirements and pushing for all this stuff. And we just could never get them, could never get them all together. You Brits, Phil, are trying to deal with Brexit. <laughs> are you ever, and, and politically here, there are just so many, I mean, you got very difficult, powerful stakeholders trying to get yeah. things done. True, true, absolutely. It's a, it's a good way of looking at it because when you look at our military, and I know you do Census Bureau stuff, Mark, I mean, have you spoken to those guys? What are they thinking about? Do they know about what's coming down the pike? What do they think? Oh uh, yeah, and that's a difficulty for PMI too. The federal government, seems to be sh shifting focus. So they're moving away, at least internally, from demanding uh, their project managers get the PMP. Oh my God. They're now focusing on something called FAC PPM that yeah. is only available to federal project managers. They're still wow. gonna require their consultants uh, and they were gonna want their consultants to get the PMP. But for their own internal people, they're moving away from that to, which, again, this fact PPM. Which, which is a little odd to me because it's kind of like saying, hey, um, let's have uh, the federal employees speak uh, Spanish and the contractors speak French and then they can all work together on projects. <laughs> it doesn't oh seem gosh. like that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> seems hey, like Phil, we should we all be to, We need to be cognizant of our, our our attendees time. Yes, we do. Uh, and uh, probably try to bring this to yes. a conclusion. Absolutely, um, I would yes. Say, does anybody have any last questions for Phil, Susan, or me, 
or the whole group, is there anything that we could uh, kind of wrap up on? Yeah, so let's wrap up really quickly, Mark, because you raised some good points. We're gonna have to come back to this. We had two great questions, but then we also have the ATP materials outline. So to add further confusion to what's going on, the PMI have come out with their ATP materials. Mark, you wanna really rapidly cover what's on the screen and okay, what it yeah. is. A lot to talk about on this, so I'm just going to do it at a high level here. So these five modules that you're seeing here now uh, make up the um, organization of the structure of the ATP courses. And so they map these five modules into the ECO. So the ECO, the examination content outline, is made up of three domains, people, process, and business. And there you see on the right-hand side of the slide, Phil's showing you the breakdown of questions between these. So go back to the five modules, Phil. So these five modules map into, so in their course materials, they're mapping tasks, they're mapping content in each module into the domains in the ECO. And there's a lot of new stuff. So there are a lot of new concepts, new terms, and things that are in these five modules that are not in the PMBOK guide. So I think it's gonna be evolving, but this stuff, I think it's gonna start appearing on the test. Mm. Uh, some of these new concepts, these two new terminologies. So my students in my PMP classes up to this point, I know it was fairly overwhelming for them just dealing with getting their arms around everything that we were teaching. The test has never, ever, ever been based purely on the PMBOK guide. It was based on the PMBOK guide plus other materials. And now they're upping the ante. So now to me, from my perspective, it looks like they're almost doubling. Oh my. Almost doubling the amount of information the students are going to have to wrap their arms around to be ready for the test in January. So 50% of the test in come January is going to be on agile and 50% is gonna be on predictive slash hybrid. Mm. But also there's going to be a lot of new stuff, I'm confident. Um, some of it, and it's not just agile, but there's other new materials from those five modules that's going to be on the test. Version seven then is also supposed to come out in either Q1, so sometime in Q1, maybe Q2. PMI is not quite promised, and that could augur in a lot of changes also. But I'm thinking that it might not uh, bring about as much change as I was thinking some months ago because they focused on the ECO. So mm -hmm. even though they're coming out with a new PMBOK guide, the ECO is not gonna change for probably another couple of years. They just updated the yes. ECO. So I think we might have a fairly stable ECO for at least three <laughs> years. And I think the test is going to be focused on that and revolving around that, not the PMBOK guide as much anymore. Um, if I could say something, Aaron, you know, and that those modules you showed, one of the things that upsets me when I look at it, it says keeping the business in mind. Yeah. At module five. Yeah, it should be first. <laughs> I mean, I know there has to be some sort of order to things, but um, I would say, uh, particularly as an agilist, but as a successful project manager for many huge projects, yeah. that it starts with keeping the business in mind because how do you yeah. create value that's developed charter the business in mind so it's very disturbing to me that that's module five not that i wouldn't mm -hmm. continue to learn and evaluate and look at changes and how to support the organization <clears throat> but it's just very odd that that's the first time the business very. is noted well, guess what um, go back very, go back to much. that slide again phil sorry <laughs> one more thing the thing it gets so this is all mishmash go back to the five modules so in module one creating a high-performing team, how the heck, so the first thing is build your team. How the heck do you know what team, what skill sets are needed until you yeah. got requirements? How I, do you know? Start with this, and it's all an agile concept to yes, team. exactly. It's all this uh, theory Y type, you know, agile ethos 
type stuff. Mm -hmm. well, wait a minute. If I'm in construction and I'm outsourcing everything to subcontractors, I'm not doing all that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing all that stuff. Oh, by the way, also in, uh, they just go back and forth between knowledge areas and, and processes yeah. and knowledge. So you're in creating high performing team. And one of the key tasks in there is negotiating. So we jump, then we jump into contracts That's right. and, we That's crazy. and we blast through fixed price, cost reimbursable time and materials real quickly, but That's they great. don't mention the, they don't mention like CPIF cost plus incentive fee. Fixed really? price. So all that, it just all we blast through it at the speed really? of light, real high level. They don't get into who has the risk in the different types of contracts, which no. is just so important. That's vital. And, and you know this firsthand way. because you've been through the training, Mark. You've been through the actual training that PMI has for the so-called instructors, right? Not for the instructors. I attended as a student. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. So a student, but you've learned, you, you've seen the material. And let, me, let me be honest. From the material I've seen that has been shared, that I was able to see, a lot of errors. Oh, a lot it doesn't, of errors. It doesn't correlate with a PMBOK guide. It's oh, bad. No. And they make, mis they make flat out mistakes. The people who wrote this, I, to me, I was wondering, could they pass the PMP? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's actually a slide where you could, they did not get the three elements of the scope baseline correctly. They, they goofed it up. How could you do that? How can you yeah. goof up what's the scope baseline? That is, that is crazy. Um, you know, I kind of, I, you know, it brings me back to the thought of, you know, when you go to make a change, one of the most important things is why, you know, Simon yeah. Sinek's book, Start With Why. Yes. I think what we're missing here is why, why are they doing this? If you gave me the why, maybe I can uh, make some understanding of these things that it just doesn't make sense to me. And well, they forced the why, Susan. They forced it on us. They've told us that it's based on the road delineation study, and they claim mm -hmm. to have surveyed their customers, and their customers right. are requesting that all training go through this process, right. this method. Mark and, Mark and I probably know well over a thousand professionals. I mean, that's like, that's that's probably us, uh, uh, you know, maybe 2,000. And then how many people they know? and. We don't know one person who was asked, how is that possible? I mean, I'm, I'm actually connected with Jeff Sutherland on LinkedIn. We're not best buddies, but <laughs> my, my network is pretty vast. I don't know one person that was asked, how is that possible? Do you exactly. know one person that was asked? I don't you know think what, he asked. <laughs> you know what else they did too here, Phil and Susan? There was a first day. Uh, so in putting together the CCO, they went outside the project management community. They went and got opinions from especially HR people. So to, that makes, if you put those modules back up again, there's a lot of kind of just all focused on soft, kind of more HR, a lot of it is the soft HR stuff and uh, the yeah. harder stuff in risk, the harder stuff in uh, you know, scope, oh, getting requirements got diluted, got watered down. It, look, Mark and Susan, we're going to have to come back and, and hit this really well again. We got this uh, question on what should the PMP certification cover? Do you think that what it covers today is out of place or do you think that it just needs to be scaled appropriately? I, I, I think that one of the things I like about the PMP certification is, is you don't just pass an exam, you have to show experience. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important for certification. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in general, what it covers currently is valid. What I, what I get concerned about is I feel like they try to ask you trick questions sure. and, and figure out what are you going to get wrong. It's like they're more concerned about the bell curve and their <laughs> pass fail rate Mm -hmm. than they are in assessing. So I do a lot of uh, development of, of uh, courses, uh, both professional courses and university courses. Mm -hmm. So you have objectives and then you have assessments that match those objectives. I don't see that connection. Instead, I see how can we create a gotcha question, mm -hmm. which, which mm -hmm. by the way, even myself with years of experience, you know, over two decades of experience and 
teaching people PMP for over 10 years, I would, I, one of those gotcha questions might get me. Me, what exactly. Mean? What does that mean? So to me, it's like, this shouldn't be about how do we get people to, you know, hit a tough question. It should be, let's match the assessment with the objectives. That, that's just how you assess. Mm. And, and a certification is an assessment of a professional skill. And project management is a professional skill. And so I, I don't like to see an attempt to get a pass fail rate that they would like. Mm -hmm. I don't want a softball. So, you know, you talk about like scrum alliances, scrum master. I know somebody <laughs> who is in leadership, took the scrum master class and she passed that. She has no idea of project management. Okay. And, and Th th there's no there's no fail rate on it i don't know yeah. i don't know one soul that has failed the csm okay True. i don't think that's True. valuable from mm. a certain perspective mm -hmm. but i also don't think you should just try every year to make questions that are harder and harder so mm -hmm. people fail like that's not that shouldn't be the point so i think that the the content that we've been teaching up till the sixth edition is the right content i think they need to scale it back instead of adding all these little things mm -hmm. that are not so important um and let the pass fail rate be what it is make sure that your your assessment is level with your objectives that's what an assessment is anything yeah. else is just some marketing ploy or business ploy or maybe they're trying to make money off of retakes i don't care but it has <laughs> nothing to do with project management <laughs> so to be frank. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, for being so frank. So I'm quite aware of the time. I know our friends are kind of looking right. at the time as well. But Mark, let's journey back in our time machine to 1995. <laughs> You're in this place taking your exam. And it's how many hours and what did you have to do to pass it? Oh, gosh. So um, again, you guys don't care. But uh, in 1995, they only gave the test, like you think, three times a year in uh, different uh, major cities across the world. It was all manual. You didn't get your results for several months, for two months uh, after wow. you took the test, just in time to know if you had to take it again. And even though there were only nine knowledge areas, um, I think there were, you knew what, uh, when you were doing a test question, you knew what knowledge area you were in, if you were in quality, if you were in cost. So you knew the knowledge area. So that made things a little easier, but there were five possible answers. It was all multiple choice, but there were five answers and they tricked it up and it was nasty just like today, <laughs> but it was really? even nastier in some ways. Wow. That they, would have, they would have five answers. So maybe A, B, C, D, E, and then you get down to D and it would say, a and B only, A and C, <laughs> but, A and C but not E. <laughs> yeah, I, I, really I, had... I took, you know, I've took, took a certification recently that was like that. I was like, oh my gosh, to wrap your head around that, yep. Yeah, so. Um, oh my God. It, it, had a, it had quite a reputation as being in a super difficult test even at that time and, and nothing of that has changed. Tell us about the but four the one members. thing that I you felt the... so, um, I always, so again, I got involved with the DC chapter, I guess, in, you know, shortly after the test in 96 and got involved in the board. And I'll be honest with you, I was very proud of the chapter and what the chapter was doing. I felt their heart was in the right place. They were serving their community of project managers. They were trying to promote project management, promote and help PMI and promote the PMP. Um, there weren't too many others. So I, that might have been the only certification from PMI at the time, I think. But they were probably the CAPM came closely after that. They were promoting that. And I felt like global. So the headquarters in Philadelphia area, I felt like uh, they too were, you know, in concert with that, that um, they were a nonprofit and mm. they were working with the chapters and we were all in this together and trying to do good, you know, trying to promote project management was a fairly young profession, right? We're the accidental profession, right? We kind of started out as a team lead. I was an SME, I was a technical guy, an operating system specialist. And as the lead for my, you know, a team, 
you keep getting assigned more management stuff, right? More project. And before you know it, lo and behold, you're a project manager. <laughs> and so you kind of move into this accidentally. And so PMI was trying to put some good practices and structure around this. And I thought that was a good thing. And another thing, uh, when I took the test, it opened my eyes to all sorts of new concepts and stuff. So at HP, we were really, really big on quality, but we had our own methodology. I didn't know anything about Six Sigma or very little. I knew a little bit about ISO 9000. So it was eye-opening. I, I only worked on fixed price contracts in the commercial area. I knew nothing about cost plus incentive fee or cost plus award fee and stuff. <laughs> good. That was a good thing. It opened my eyes. And uh, even though I knew I probably wasn't going to use much of that, uh, it was still good to get exposure to it. Mm. So I kind of feel like they've lost their way, mm. really lost their way a bit. And uh, I would, I hope, you know, I hope that they get back to those basics and uh, trying to serve. They got to figure out who are their customers? Mm. How do we really provide value? What is the real value that uh, we could provide them. And, and I'm afraid uh, there's too much profit motive uh, mm -hmm. in some of the things that they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I agree with that. And I also think that they should be more reaching out to connecting with the PMI chapters as a vehicle yeah. uh, right. to manage those stakeholders. Grassroots. Um, Mark and I will both tell you, we have spent many an hour dedicating our free time, energy, and passion for project management in mm -hmm. chapters, more than one chapter. And I also direct my students, my <coughs> university students. I teach a lot of mm -hmm. master's degree students, MBA students, and I direct them to get involved with their chapter so that yeah. they can have experience in project management. Um, they can network. Um, you, you should never network when you're looking for a job. You should network when you have one. Exactly. Um, so, so that's a great place to network. And so I've, I've continued to support that, but I, I feel like how PMI deals with this in the next three to six months, it, it may shift where I send my students to. Mm -hmm. I may not send them to the chapter if I feel like that isn't a value. And, and that would make me very upset because like you, Phil, I, I like PMI. I mean, mm -hmm. I've dedicated a lot of time, hours, energy, yeah. and I'm, I'm sad. And I mean, I guess everybody, nobody likes change that's imposed on them, mm -hmm. but this is a particular example of not only is it, have we not been engaged with it, but perhaps the change is not a change that meets the needs of the stakeholders, which mm -hmm. then that's even worse than it being imposed on you and being something that actually could be good to being something mm -hmm. that is actually destroying the things that are of value to you. You know, if you, exactly. if PMI doesn't ask us what is valuable about the PMBOK guy, what is valuable about the certification and they change it and that change removes the things that are valuable to us, where are we left? What do we do? Where do we send professionals who want to learn about project management? I mean, you know, Mark and I, we can continue to teach people best practices, things that we know we know work. I mean, fundamentally, you know, your best practices, it's empirical. You know, mm -hmm. you do enough projects and, you know, it all comes down to risk management, change management, stakeholder management. You need to think about quality. You need to plan scope. You need to estimate your schedule. You need to estimate your cost. But it's like, it's, it's after a while, it all is kind of the same, but it's, that's yeah. empirical data. And that's mm -hmm. the standard is a best practice based on empirical data. So you can't just say, well, we decided that this is now the best way to do it. That's a good it's not, it, it's, it's not your decision to make. It's made empirically. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm writing that note down. The standard should be based on empirical data. So what is this effigy of greatness they're creating? It's like a shadow of the good times past that was actual data that was empirical. This is going towards some, someone dreamt, oh, well, in order to make some more buck, why don't we do this? That's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like to me. And I don't, you know, without knowing the purpose and without having a clear path, I mean, if anything, I like to look at this situation and say, what can I learn about it? What I can learn about it is this is why it's so important to listen to your stakeholders, engage them, understand your business, 
understand what's value and how the how what you're doing provides value to your customer. This is a perfect example. There are no the best examples are the ones where things are not done well. Okay, yeah. as as sure. as instructors, I can't teach you so much from a project that's run well. I can teach you a lot from one that's not, and yeah. it, and it and it's not, and it's not. I'm not. I'm saddened by the fact that it's not. You know, I. I I still hold out hope that they fix it. I hope it's new Coke and they come back with classic yeah. Coke. <laughs> I, 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 really, so. I really hope that because I don't want to have to go figure out what's the new standard or best practice because this isn't really one that's applicable anymore. It's, it, I don't want them to make themselves um, insignificant or, or mm -hmm. not, not valuable. I mean, Absolutely. You know, like, In trying to be a monopoly, they're going to make them an entity and i keep saying it's not the principal <laughs> management institute it's the project management institute the final question here which mark brought up is what should the pmp exam really be and i think we pretty much guided it down the path of what we're teaching the 10 knowledges of five process groups that's good agile of course is here to stay so those who are anti-agile need to also wake up and smell the coffee and embrace agile I think the exam for the future needs to be based on real things that people need. Mark, any comments on this one? No. Before we round up? <laughs> well, let's go to our final page, Mark. So uh, Susan, feel free to share your information because I've not included it on the final slide. So please, how can people get hold of you since uh, the information is not up here? Uh, email address, uh, contact information, LinkedIn information, can we find you on LinkedIn, Susan? Yes, you can. Um, you should be able to easily find me on LinkedIn um, under Susan Parente. Um, it, it says that I'm in the DC area. So that, that should be some validation and uh, a gotcha. picture that somewhat looks like me. I think my hair is pulled back, sorry. About that. <laughs> okay. um, challenge, challenging for women with hairstyles. Um, and there's a bridge in the background, but, uh, <laughs> but if you see a Susan Parente in DC, that should be me. And um, yeah, great. Thank you for that. And uh, I have a website, but I don't use that a whole lot. So, um, and if you can't find me in one of those ways, you can reach out to to Mark. He should be able to find me and 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 yourself too. You 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 help somebody out if they need to. Absolutely, I will definitely link anyone up with you. And uh, Mark, we got your information on the screen. The Horizon PMTraining.com, and they can reach you at that email. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay, and uh, and if you got an email for if you didn't get her, she did put up her email real quick in the chat window a minute ago. So maybe Susan put that back up again. But um, if you send an email, you want to get hold of Susan, just send it to my email. I will forward it to her. Gotcha. Okay, and there's the information for Prazion, uh, Prazion com. You can email support at Prazion com. Want to say a huge thank you to our guests, uh, Susan, Mark, and everyone else who has joined, who is still here. I know some folks had to dash up, but uh, we, we've still got Angela, Cesar, uh, David, uh, James, Johannes, and Daryl, and anyone else who came through. Thank you very much. We're going to stop the recording formally for now, but we're going to do open mic and uh, get any additional questions. But officially, we are going to end the recording. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll do this again. This is just uh, episode one of probably three or four. So thank you. Great, Phil. Thank, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody had really great questions too. So and, and look yeah. forward to some more here after the recording. Thank you. Thank you.